Hello and welcome to a special edition of Palace Confidential where we'll be looking back at some of our fascinating conversations with royal authors from the past few weeks. I'm Luke Blackall, standing in for Joe Elvin. Let us know what you think about the show and the royals. You can leave us a comment or send us a question. Details on screen now about how to do that. And a reminder, you can click the links below to buy all the books featured today. First up is a clip from our popular interview with Valentine Lowe, authors of Courtiers, The Inside Story. Now, you said that um, Diana used to sort of like eye-rollingly refer to men in grey suits, yeah. but there doesn't seem to be an enormous amount of women. Is that fair? It, it is absolutely and fair. Why I mean, is that? I mean th there are women, but mm. you, I'll notice Charles, Prince Charles, now the king, has never had a woman private secretary, principal private secretary, ever. Mm. He's had about 10, I think. Prince William, who has done what he can to kind of modernize how he runs the household and has really tried to make it a, a bit more inclusive. He has never had a woman uh, as principal private secretary. So, yeah. And don't get me started on the lack of ethnic minorities. Uh, yes. Well, that's another interesting thing, isn't it? It's a pretty a pale male stale environment. But do you think, is there, I'm being cheeky with this, but is it just that King Charles can't bear the idea of being yelling at a woman it's my, he's like you know he's much more likely to feel comfortable losing his temper well that. well he, he he does yell a bit i mean yeah. he, in in the description of someone i spoke to he goes to from naught to 60 in a flash well we've seen uh, haven't we yeah, yeah we've seen with the pens yeah. but he i think he recovers quite quickly and it's i don't think it's necessarily aimed at people personally um it's aimed at situations um mm. but he does get does get frustrated uh, does he not like to shout at a woman um i'm not so sure about that <laughs> well, there was someone called sally osman who was his communications secretary for a while um and he welcomed her you know she was the new thing and then <laughs> within a week um he lost his temper, and later he said to someone else, you know, he was very worried that he, he might put Sally off uh, already after a new week. Well, so he you, really may well, you may as well know what you're getting in for, but, yeah. but what do you think, do you think the courtiers have, in their ways, shaped the kind of king that Charles will be? I think they, partly they've shaped the kind of king he'll be, but also they've reflected it. I mean, it's very interesting, the different courtiers, the different sort of private secretaries he's had at different times of life have kind of reflected who Charles was. So there was a time when he was very much about setting up his charities. He was the prince with a social conscience and, and the successful advisors from that era were those who were very much in tune with that and the unsuccessful ones and they were unsuccessful unsuccessful ones were the ones who didn't really kind of believe in Charles's mission in the way he did but later Charles moved on to different things and he became he wanted to cast himself more as a kind of global statesman and and it was the job of the people around him to help shape that and reflect that and, and advance that. One story that has long been discussed is Tiara Gate. Um, and you provide some clarity on this one. Yes, I mean, from, from what I understand, um, the, the original version of that story which surfaced suggested there was a row about which tiara uh, Meghan would have for her wedding. And I don't think that's the case. That's, I mean, that's wrong. I mean, she was given by the Queen a choice of tiaras. She chose one. It's the one she wrote, wore at the wedding, and that was all absolutely fine. Where the problem came was a short while later was that um, she wanted to have a, a fitting. So it was for, for her hair, because it, you, as you can imagine, Wearing a tiara and having your head on for your wedding, they're closely entwined. You, um, we've one, all been there, Valentine. We have, we've we all have. been there, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, Meghan's hairdresser was in town. I, I think he was based in Paris. He, he was in town, and therefore she wanted a fitting. Uh, and the problem was that Angela Kelly, who was the Queen's dresser and a lot more beside, who basically had the keys, mm. controlled access to the tiara, she wasn't around. And Meghan was demanding, Meghan and Harry were demanding that we have the fitting today. And Angela said, it's, Angela Kelly said, sorry, I'm not available. And that caused a certain amount of um, dissent in the ranks, you say. Oh dear. Um, well, you actually do paint quite a detailed picture of the entrance and eventual exit of Meghan and Harry. And the problems seemed to start very early there, didn't they? 
Yeah, I think, so. I mean, the problem started before the wedding. I mean, there were, there were a lot of rows uh, before the wedding about all sorts of things, not just the tiara, about the choir, about the food. Uh, and there was a problem when um, the kind of... The drip, of inf the drip of news stories. Before the wedding, yeah. you'd always have a drip of news stories. The palace would put out little details about the cake, uh, about the dress, about the whatever, um, to keep the media happy. Uh, and somehow Meghan thought we ought to change that because it wasn't suiting her for some reason. Uh, and they had to rip up plans. And some poor woman was uh, presented an alternative plan and Meghan was really unhappy with this alternative plan and said to this woman, listen, if there's anybody else I can get to do this, believe me, I would. That is my favourite quote from the book. It's just such a devastating it's thing to say to It's such a crushing somebody. thing to say in front of other people. It's yeah. just extraordinary. And now, Samantha Cohen's another one who has worked with the Sussexes. She was very popular. She was a very popular member of the Queen's staff before she moved to work for them. What, what was her experience of that? I think Sam, who, uh, as you say, was very popular, very highly regarded, and gone on well, you know, Harry knew her well. When she, when she started, Harry knew her well and liked her, and she yeah. liked Harry. Uh, and she's a, Sam is a great problem solver. She's incredibly sort of can-do personality. Uh, and um, she just found it really difficult. I think she was asked to do things which a private secretary wouldn't normally be, be asked to do. And I think she was treated harshly she was i think she was shouted up by by megan and, and possibly harry i don't know mm. uh and you know she she's got broad shoulders sam but she i think she found it very difficult she was said to have said that uh dealing with them was like dealing with a couple of teenagers yeah it's fascinating that's the thing and it, it, i think sometimes in our press it becomes all about megan's deaverish behavior but harry was capable of angry emails and strops as well yeah i mean mm. harry who has a long track record of not trusting the courtiers from the other household from buckingham yeah. palace or from clarence house he really had it in for uh, sir edward young the queen's private secretary and sir clive alston charles's private secretary and from, from the accounts i've been told used to send them incredibly rude emails mm. now <laughs> A lot of, um, you say that the staff called Meghan a narcissistic sociopath. I mean, that's quite strong. <laughs> it is strong. And, and they'd, also, yeah. they'd also say, we were played. They, you know. How so? They, they felt that um, she always had an agenda to get out. Um, really? The, the, From the, even before? Even before. It was, that we her, knew yeah, about it, yeah. yeah. And they, they had been devoted. They had really tried hard to make it work. Uh, um, but they they had a rough time and uh, they they've, they felt treated badly. How do you um, feel about the successes having done all this research? Um, I think it's quite complex because I think there was never what they wanted and what the royal family really the Queen felt able to provide. There was, no, there was never going to be any common meeting ground. There was no compromise. So in a sense, I think it was inevitable that they should leave. But the, the, the tragedy was it was so acrimonious. It didn't have to be so acrimonious. Mm. Next up, let's hear from Katie Nicholl, author of The New Royals, Queen Elizabeth's legacy and the future of the crown. And you reveal that if it weren't for a BBC blunder, we would actually know a lot more than we do about the Queen. Yes, well, the, the, Philip Bonham Carter, the cameraman who I mentioned to you earlier, he worked on, well, he worked on the royal family, so there's some wonderful stories about behind the scenes on the royal family in the book. And he worked on Elizabeth R. And that was made during the early 90s, so a, a very difficult time for the royal family, mm. of course, 92 being oh, her, my goodness. Anna's Horribilis. Mm. And, um, but apparently, most of that archive, the outtakes and, and, and everything else, have, 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 gone, have gone missing. So well, yeah, Somebody must have those. Somebody well, must know. They've not, they've not been seen or recovered. So I think there's a lot of footage that, that unfortunately, sadly, has been, has been lost. Did he tell you any of the nature of that? You know, what kind of things that he saw that no one else will see? Um, well, he, he got to see, yes, he did. He got to see um, Margaret Thatcher go to see the Queen when she resigned, got to see after that. Um, I mean, he had pretty remarkable access. I mean, he, he said to me on more than one occasion, he thought he'd be asked to put his cameras 
down and he never was the cameras were old and rolled and rolled and the Queen was incredibly generous with her access That's and then amazing. invited him to watch the edit and apparently you got invited to go and watch the final program if the Queen was pleased with it so she must have been okay, pleased with it because yeah, they so got invited for tea rather than to the straight to the tower um, now you do uh, print interviews with the late lady Elizabeth Anson who was a cousin and confidant of the Queen what kind of a picture of the monarch did she give you a fascinating one. Um, I mean, I've been very respectful to the memory of, of Lady Elizabeth, and, and we had a friendship that spanned, well, well over a decade. Mm -hmm. And I suppose she got to see the Queen in a way that very few other people did. Um, she maintained a, a close contact with her cousin all through the COVID pandemic, and she gave some quite fascinating insight into the run-up to the royal wedding. And she really conveyed to me the Queen as a person and we forget she was a person, a human with real feelings and emotions mm. and um, you know I, I, I got to I think I got to see more of that side to the Queen and really learnt a lot more about her as a grandmother, as a great grandmother um, you know because she played so many roles she wasn't just monarch she played many roles. I think so many of us really want to know what she was really thinking in the whole Sussex's drama mm. of the last couple of years. I mean, while she was still alive, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been very at pains to say that they've got nothing but admiration and respect and they're still in contact with her. What, how far, is that the reality? Well, they, it's very true that they were still in touch with her. I mean, I know that the Queen would, would take calls always from, from Harry. She always made time. She loved Harry. Mm. They had a very, very special relationship. But my understanding from the conversations I had was that she could never truly understand why he gave it all up because for a young girl who was never destined to be queen but who made that pledge to serve for her a whole life duty ran it was in her dna mm. so the idea that one of hers could could turn their backs on that duty i think she did struggle to to understand that and, well apparently you quote elizabeth answer as saying that the queen was actually upset by harry's comments about duty she um she i think she was upset she 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 couldn't understand that um the, I know the comment, you're, let me just pick that up. I think the comment we're speaking about here is after Harry had um, spoken about no one wanting the responsibility of being king. I'm paraphrasing, but it was an interview with Newsweek. Um, and um, she just couldn't understand that, that that comment, that sort of no one would want duty. I mean, because she was thrust into it yeah. with no choice whatsoever. When her father became king, the one certainty in her life was that she would be queen. And that was just non-negotiable. Mm. I want to talk just briefly about this uh, thing you write about, that she was astonished by William and Kate's decision to not hire a nanny. How do you think she viewed the way well, the Cambridges I did things? Uh, one of the stories I was told was that the Queen went to visit Prince George when he was just born and they were still living at Kensington Palace. They, had, they hadn't moved to Anmer at that point. They were in a little cottage. It wasn't the big apartment. And um, the Queen had gone to visit and I think, you know, George was having a good old scream. It was that very hot summer. There was no air conditioning. I think there was a fan on rotation. <laughs> and, um, I love that even, that's, even the royals can't get good air conditioning. No, even the royals didn't. <laughs> not in that cottage, they didn't. And um, no nanny, no night nurse, no nanny, no anything. And, and of course, for the Queen, who'd sort of grown up in that generation where, you know, the royal children did have a nanny. I mean, the Queen went off and did a tour of the Commonwealth well, when she and, had young well, children. Well, even as a child, I'd heard of Crawfee. Yes, Craw like, we yeah, all heard of yeah. You know, that was what she was used to. Um, yes, she was very surprised that there wasn't a nanny. And of course, eventually, they did hire a nanny. But again, it was them wanting to be hands-on from the start. Some of you may have watched our interview with Angela Levin, author of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, from outcast to future queen consort. But it is some of that interview that didn't make the final cut, where she shares some inside information about the queen consort's relationship with the late Princess of Wales. It was very difficult for Camilla to um, deal with Diana. She and Prince Charles were uh, ideally suited for each other. He was 22, he was 24 when they met. But when she realised that they couldn't marry, or Prince Charles realised, because she wasn't a virgin and she wasn't aristocrat enough, um, they decided to split up and they would only be friends. And they were like that for at least six years. People don't believe it, but actually that's what happened. Um, and she wanted him 
Prince Charles to be happy, and she was um, tried to be kind to Diana, you know, take her out for lunch. This all got very twisted that she wanted to show how she knew Charles much better than she did. Um, and I think it was um, very, very difficult for all of them. But then when things got very bad between Charles and Diana, two of his friends rang her, she didn't rang them, and said, we're really, really worried about him. Can you please ring him? Can you please talk to him? Because he's so depressed, he feels he's let her down so much. And can you try and help us? And so she called and they met. And then I think they, um, Camilla and Charles, just got back together again. Um, it wasn't ideal, but it was, um, they were just drawn to each other, they're made for each other, and it was very hard, whereas Diana and Charles had very, very little, if anything, in common outside of their children. Prince William was very wary of Camilla. Uh, he adored his mother, he didn't want somebody stepping in in her shoes. I think he was helped there a lot by his wife, Catherine, because she comes from a very stable family and a very loving family, and if there was any arguments, they worked hard to get over them. And slowly, she's made her mark with him too. One, because she's made their father very happy, more relaxed. Um, he's got much more in common now with Charles. And um, she makes everybody laugh. And when the grandchildren started coming, she didn't try and take over or suggest things. She's got her own, she's got her own children. But the little ones have taken to her, they find her she's OK, she doesn't interfere. Um, and they've got on very well now. Catherine often goes off with Charles and Camilla to see art things. There's a great sort of, there's a friendship there, there's a warmth there. And apparently Catherine was very grateful for what Camilla showed her and told her about before she got married. Camilla likes having gatherings at Clarence House. I don't suppose that will carry on for much longer. But she had one for um, successful women. And one of the people who she invited was Emerald Fennell. And she had played Camilla in the last couple of episodes of The Crown. Um, you would think that she would have been furious but um, Camilla sort of went round that, and in her speech she said, um, I'm very glad that you came, and um, it's very satisfying for me to know that should I collapse and pass away, that you would be there just to take over straight away. And of course, everybody laughed. It was just a very clever way of saying, you know, um, I know this is dosh, I know that you've done this about me, but actually, you're nothing like me at all. But I like you, and so let's just be friends. And I think that um, it was a very, very carefully thought out. And she does this with a lot of things. She doesn't make a fuss, but she'll do something where anybody who's got a bit of brain can see that she's handling it very well and sees the funny side. Camilla was always very um, friendly to William and Harry. Um, she cared for them and she um, tried not to push herself too forward. She's always trodden very, very carefully. Um, we heard when, we, when we, they got married, Prince Harry said, you know, we love her to bits, but that obviously hasn't lasted through the years. She tried very hard with Meghan to please her. She'd done this with Catherine because she'd had such a terrible time when she joined the royal family. She tried to tell them where the um, holes could be and the uh, protocols that sound ridiculous but they need to follow and to give them an understanding of a very different life. Uh, Catherine was very grateful. I'm told that Meghan wasn't interested, really. The Queen had liked Camilla very much when she was married to Andrew Parker Bowles, and they were very happy with her. But once she started going out with Prince Charles again, she refused to have anything to do with her. And eventually, she and 
Prince Philip realised that this is the one thing that Charles has put his foot down on and she's just not going to um, leave her for someone else. And uh, it was very, very gradually done. Um, they met um, at one party. They didn't sit together, but they just said hello and Camilla curtsied. Um, but they didn't want it to, to happen. But over time, they noticed that Camilla never complained. She never answered back. She was doing tremendous dutiful work for, the, for all the charities that she could. And she was being um, very helpful and supportive of Prince Charles, who changed his demeanor enormously. He looked happy, he looked relaxed. He could rely on her. He'd had a, quite a hard time and he just felt that here was someone who was there for him. And that's how it's been ever since. If you look, you notice that she walks one step behind him. This is not because she feels inferior. This is what she feels is her duty. She's there for him. And then once they've introduced each other to the people who've invited them wherever they're going, she moves up. But on her own, she's very forceful and strong. She's also very, very keen on literacy. And she goes around the country talking to families who've had a very hard time and trying to encourage them to get their children to read, which she does with great fun. She takes the author. This is what she takes advantage of her position. And she can say to whoever's written a book, will you come along? I'd like you to meet some children. And she can get them to sort of joke and laugh because she feels that if you can read, you, the world is open to you. You've got a chance to find a job and all those sorts of things. So she does this very strongly on her own. But with Charles, she defers to him, except, except they've both got very sensitive senses of humour. And on many occasions, um, they just burst out laughing and giggle. And I think this is um, something very soft about the relationship. Now that um, Camilla is known as Queen Consort, obviously a lot is going to change in her life. She won't be looking through the red box, which the Queen always does, uh, did every day. She won't make big decisions. She won't tell him how to do things, but she will be there to support him. Um, it's a very hard job to do, and she will be there to do that. And that's Palace Confidential for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Joe Elvin, Richard Eden and the gang will be back next week. Goodbye.